Good evening and welcome. Welcome to the NNDC Visiting Professor Public Lecture. I'm Dr. Sagar Parikh. I'm a psychiatrist and professor at the University of Michigan Depression Center, and I'll be your host for this evening's public education talk. This talk will be approximately one hour, and we will have ample time to take questions. And I'll just alert you now that the way we'll be taking questions at the end is at the bottom of your browser, there is a, an area known as the Q&A area. It is not the chat function. It's right beside the chat function. And as the talk progresses, if you think of a question, feel free to start typing there. And at uh, roughly after about 30 to 40 minutes, when the lecture portion of the talk uh, is concluded, we'll be really excited to go through your questions. So uh, a little bit of background. This talk is being sponsored by two organizations, the University of Michigan Depression Center and the National Network of Depression Centers. The National Network of Depression Centers, or the NNDC, is an organization comprised of 26 leading universities who are together involved in research and education and clinical care around mood disorders. That organization also sponsors a program known as the Visiting Professor Program, which allows a distinguished professor from one institution to come and visit, usually in person, but today, unfortunately, only online. Uh, it allows a person, a, a distinguished professor, to visit uh, another institution. And I'm delighted today to be able to tell you about our guest. Our guest is Dr. Catherine Burdick. She is a clinical neuropsychologist who does an awful lot of research about, oh, I forget, what is it? Uh, it's cognition, that's what it is. She, yes, sorry about that. Um, she has devoted her career, the past 20 years of her research career, to trying to understand how, how does cognition, the way we think, the way we remember, the way we process decisions, how we plan for things, all of the things that fall under cognition, how are they affected if you develop a psychiatric uh, or for that matter, a neurologic illness. Uh, most of her career has been focused, of course, on the question of cognition and its impairment in psychiatric disorder. She comes to us with a, uh, a typical East Coast uh, uh, background. She did a lot of her training and got her uh, PhD at the City University of New York. She went to Yale for additional uh, research training and started her research career there and uh, returned to New York where she was uh, a professor at, at the Mount Sinai School of Medicine. And then four years ago, she wanted out of town and she headed up the, uh, the river, so to speak, and she's now in Boston. She is uh, the vice chair for research in the Department of Psychiatry at uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital and she's an associate professor at Harvard Medical School. Her work, as I mentioned, is on uh, neuropsychology uh, uh, and, and, and specifically on cognition. And she has studied what goes wrong and how to measure it and how to fix it in a variety of psychiatric disorders, particularly schizophrenia and bipolar uh, disorder. So today, uh, we're really going to be uh, having a treat because she's going to tell us about understanding this topic in greater detail. The official title of her presentation tonight is Cognition in Patients with Psychiatric Disorders, How to Measure It and Why It Matters. Dr. Burdick. Thank you very much, Sagar. And, and certainly I, I'd love to thank the NNDC and the University of Michigan for the support for this visiting professorship. Um, Again, of course, it is unfortunate that we are not doing this in person, but I think hopefully we'll get um, just as much out of it as we would have if I had been there myself. So let's get this running. Okay, so um, I also need to make me smaller on my screen and move me over. Okay. Um, great. So as, as Sagar mentioned, I will be talking today about cognition in, in patients with psychiatric illness. 
this and um, giving a kind of overview of the way in which we as neuropsychologists and clinicians um, measure cognition in patients. And um, this is the kind of approach that's used across multiple different kinds of illnesses. It's also the way we measure cognition in healthy people when we think about looking at profiles associated with strengths and weaknesses. And so I'll walk you through some of the, the kind of definitions of these different um, components of, of cognition and give you some examples of the way in which we, we actually assess that. And then I'm gonna talk a little bit more about what we think we know about some of the causes of the problems that are cognitively associated with disorders like bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. And I'll talk very briefly about some of the things in which uh, ways in which we're, we're thinking about approaching intervening on that or treating those problems in patients. So I'm just gonna start with a kind of general overview um, in, in talking more about what these diagnoses look like, what these disorders are, and the way in which they've been differentiated from, from one another. So the two I'm gonna focus on primarily will be schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. But I want to certainly emphasize that many of the things that I talk about with regard to cognition the risk factors around cognitive deficits, and some of the consequences of these illnesses on the brain also um, kind of crosses over into other psychiatric illnesses, including things like major depression, autism, attention deficit disorder, and many other neuropsychiatric illnesses. And so while I will give, be giving mostly examples around these two diagnoses, uh, it's a bit more broadly applicable than that. So I'm also happy to address questions at the end. If there are more questions that are specific to things that I didn't cover, I'll try to handle those as best I can. So this, this first slide really just um, presents a, a couple pictures to guide me in telling you about some of the history behind our diagnoses. So it was about 100, 110 years ago that the man on the left named Emil Kraepelin distinguished the or defined the disorders schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And these are just represented here by the images on the screen. But at the time, what he referred to uh, dementia praecox, which is now called schizophrenia, he defined based in large part on having primary psychotic features. So this is including things like hallucinations where patients are seeing things that, that are not necessarily there, um, hearing voices and things of that nature, and delusional beliefs, believing something that is not based in fact. Those kinds of psychotic features are the primary feature that really distinguishes schizophrenia from many other disorders. When we look at bipolar disorder, then called manic depressive psychosis, that is primarily defined by the episodic mood changes that are associated with the illness. So that's represented down here in this image where we're showing that there's a range of severe mood dysregulation. So patients who are diagnosed with bipolar disorder will experience at times severe episodes of mania, which is characterized by euphoric, highs, lots of energy, a lack of need for sleep, productivity, some of the things that sound awfully good, but also is defined by disability because of behaviors that fall outside of the range of normal. On contrast, patients with bipolar disorder will also experience severe lows in their mood, which is characterized by severe depression. Most people are familiar with what depression looks like, uh, more so perhaps than psychosis and mania, but these are characterized in bipolar patients quite similar to that seen in unipolar depression or major depression with a loss of appetite, uh, sometimes more sleeping, sometimes problem sleeping, but a very sad mood, sometimes suicidal thoughts. And this is seen in, in patients with manic depression or bipolar disorder in an episodic fashion. So what that means is that there are periods of time they experience mania, there are periods of time they experience depression, but there are also periods of time right in the middle here where, where they achieve what we think of as a normal balanced mood, where things seem to be going fine, just as a sort of uh, non-psychiatric healthy individual would experience mood regulation. That is in stark contrast with the definition in patients with schizophrenia, where those diagnosed with schizophrenia show a, a considerably more chronic course. So what that means is that once diagnosed with schizophrenia, the symptoms linger in a way that doesn't remit fully. It doesn't go away completely, the way in which we believe many patients with bipolar disorder recover. So this was the way that Emil Kraepelin defined these illnesses. This is the way we think about them today in large part. 
and they are distinguished from one another. Uh, one patient cannot have both diagnoses. This is the way we've set this up in the DSM-5, which you see on the right of the screen. This is the book by which we use uh, and we define our own diagnoses now, currently. And so it is not possible to have a diagnosis of schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, despite the fact that there's a fair amount of clinical overlap. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about that um, as we kind of go through these, what, what is now believed to be better understood were the overlapping features of these illnesses that were once thought to be very different from one another are now seen. So for an example for this, as I mentioned, the um, diagnosis of schizophrenia is primarily made based on the presence of psychotic features. But a very large group of patients with schizophrenia also experience depression. And some patients with schizophrenia also experience full manic episodes. So you can have a diagnosis of schizophrenia and still have a lot of features of bipolar disorder that look very similar, but the diagnosis of schizophrenia is based on the chronicity of the illness. Likewise, on the flip side, if you have a patient with bipolar disorder, again, primarily defined by the mood dysregulation associated with the illness, you can also have about half of those patients will experience full-blown psych psychotic features, including hallucinations, including delusions. But the differentiation there is that those patients only experience those features when they're affectively unwell. So when they're in a manic or depressive state. When their mood becomes normal and balanced, those psychotic features go away. Whereas schizophrenia patients, those psychotic features tend to, tend to continue and persist in the course of disease. So while they're different illnesses, and we still acknowledge them as such today, there's a clear understanding of, of similar sorts of clinical profiles. The symptoms that these patients experience can be quite similar. And as such, the treatments for these disorders can be very similar as well. One of the things that's particularly interesting in the field of research is that over the past couple of decades, we've learned a lot more about the underlying biology associated with these illnesses. What's causing these disorders? What's going wrong in the brain? What are the risk factors that are associated with developing these illnesses? And the kinds of consequences that occur for after having these illnesses for long periods of time. And perhaps surprisingly, based on our kind of historical differentiation of these illnesses, we've learned that there's an enormous amount of overlap at this level as well. So as we think about the kinds of things that contribute to these illnesses, I won't talk a lot in detail about the genetics of these disorders, but both bipolar disorder and schizophrenia are highly heritable. What that means is that there is a genetic basis to this. It means it runs in families to the extent that if you have a parent with one of these illnesses, you are more likely to develop this disorder. However, it's never a guarantee. There's a lot more to it than genetics, but we do acknowledge that genetics are playing a pretty significant part of risk for the illness. It was once believed for many years, really until probably 20 years ago, that the genetics were very specific to the illness. So that is to say that if your parent has a diagnosis of schizophrenia, you're at increased risk for schizophrenia, but only schizophrenia. Likewise, if your parent has bipolar disorder, the risk for you is increased for bipolar disorder. Based on more recent studies that are very large studies out of Sweden and other places where they characterize very large populations, we now know that those risk factors are shared such that if your parent has schizophrenia, you also have an increased risk for bipolar disorder. So this has been a, a relatively new finding in the field, this understanding that these disorders um, run in families, not in any very specific way, but that there, there are broad genetic risk factors that are associated with a lot of different neuropsychiatric disorders. More recent studies that look specifically at genetic variants, so, so we look at the human genome and we look for risk variants within the genome that are associated with an increased risk for these disorders. What we find is that most of the genetic risk variants that are associated with schizophrenia are also associated with bipolar disorder and major depression and autism. And what the picture of genetics is beginning to look like is that what's inherited is a broad risk for psychiatric illness rather than a risk for any specific disorder.
Now, this is important because our understanding of these, the causes of these diseases has largely been guided by the idea that they were different from one another. We now know that there are a lot of risk factors that are shared. Many of these are genetic risk factors. And the way that we kind of make sense of this is by looking at features that, that overlap in these disorders. These genetic variances, the, the, the genetic variants that cause increased risk are acting on the brain in a way to make the brain vulnerable to psychiatric illness. We can measure certain components of brain function to try to get at what it is that this risk is. And in my lab, my group focuses specifically on cognitive deficits. And this is in this figure on the left here, you can see this is one of these traits that overlaps multiple disorders. We look at different illnesses and we see deficits in patients with schizophrenia. We see deficits in patients with bipolar disorder. And we believe that this might be a marker of brain dysfunction that has placed a patient at risk and that this may be related to the genetic changes that are associated with these illnesses. So the neurobiology and the genetic risk factors seem to overlap. In addition, if you look to the right of the screen, what you're seeing is a, a brain scan, and this is just a simple MRI structural brain scan, and this is in patients with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. And what I want to highlight here are the, you can not see it very well, but you can see that there are yellow dots in various parts of the brain. And where you see the yellow dots, this is where we know that patients with bipolar disorder have structural loss. So they have volume loss in the brain after many years of having the illness. When you look in the blue, where you see the blue dots on these pictures, these are regions of the brain that show structural loss in patients who are diagnosed with schizophrenia. And where you look at the green, where yellow and blue combine, what we see are these many brain regions that are associated with structural loss of having both of these illnesses, so either one of these illnesses. The consequences to the brain of having these disorders, there are some unique, but there are many that overlap across these illnesses. So we're really beginning to understand at the level of the brain, at the level of genes, that these disorders are not as discrete as we once thought they were. And likewise, as Kraepelin back in um, more than 100 years ago, distinguished bipolar patients from schizophrenia patients based in large part on functional recovery, making the assumption that bipolar patients would recover completely in between episodes and that their cognitive function would recover. They could go back to work. They could function normally in their, in their lives. Whereas patients with schizophrenia, there was less likely chances of that happening. We now understand that there is an enormous amount of overlap in functional disability and in cognitive problems associated with these illnesses, even when patients are remitted from their affective episodes. So I'm now gonna kind of spend the next 10 slides or so really talking more specifically about how we measure cognition. This is gonna give you an example of some of the domains, what the, the languages that we use around cognitive um, testing and cognitive outcomes. And I'm gonna give a couple examples, a little bit of an interactive component to, to show you what it's like for those of you who've never had cognitive testing done. Many of us have this done for school, for academic testing, for various other things. Um, typically what an, a, a, an overall battery includes is an IQ assessment, and I'm going to go through and define these terms. So we get a general IQ assessment on an individual, and then typically we also do a, a full neuropsychological battery. And this kind of gives us a, a better idea of specific domains of cognitive functioning, whereas IQ assessments tend to give us more of a capacity, a broad idea of how someone is functioning cognitively. So I'll talk a little bit about each of these. Intelligence, most of you are going to be familiar with the concept and certainly um, have heard of IQ. Um, almost everyone has, has read something about this, this, con this construct. Um, the intelligence itself measures a general ability. So this is uh, what we think of most broadly as being how smart you are, but um, it's a little bit more refined than that. The intelligence quotient or your IQ is a number that's assigned based on um, the actual tests that are given. There's some controversy around these tests, around these numbers. Um, I'm just going to be kind of walking you through what these mean and what the labels are of current, current nomenclature, current um, language around IQ. As mentioned, this is a global measure, 
typically when we look in psychiatric patients, we're interested in two measures of IQ. One's called premorbid IQ, and this is suggesting um, that we can get some kind of es estimate of how a person would be expected to perform if he or she didn't have an illness. This is true if you have schizophrenia, if you have traumatic brain injury, even if you have cancer, we would call all the premorbid IQ something that was an estimate of your intelligence before you became sick. And then we were also very interested in current IQ. So this is how you're doing now, regardless of your illness state. So this is a, a, a different, it's a different number in individuals who have had some kind of disorder or diagnosis. In a person who's perfectly healthy, the premorbid IQ and the current IQ would look very similar to one another. But the reason why these are important in psychiatric illnesses and neurological illnesses is these can give us an idea of whether or not we've seen cognitive decline or cognitive change over time, which is very important as a clinician and it's very important to patients. So this is really to try to give us an idea of where a person started and where they are now. There are certainly possibilities that you'll see cognitive improvement over time, but generally speaking, we're looking at these from a neuropsych standpoint um, in, in trying to indicate whether or not there's been some problem or some change in cognition that's been declined. So this is what IQ numbers look like. Um, in the kind of psychometric world, I can tell you that the mean is 100 and the standard deviation is 15. But what that means is that you are solidly average if you're anywhere in the range 90 to 109. And then we start to break this down into kind of the, the, the newest labels for IQ. You see along here, what you don't see here are things like terms like mental retardation. We don't even use the terms developmentally disabled. Um, these give a better um, idea of where a person is functioning along these scales. The older language would suggest this borderline number here is where people would be eligible for help in school and other things used to be referred to borderline mental retardation. Um, this language has changed and so you can kind of see just the distribution and the way the language we use from a neuropsychological standpoint. Um, typically what you see when you hear about genius, it will be this kind of 130 and above range. Um, there are people who will note that they have 160 IQ. Most of the tests for IQ don't go that high. Um, so typically we try to kind of use this as a, as a cutoff point, suggesting that that IQ is very superior. So some specific domains and examples of these. Um, attention is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk through these and what we think about as the hierarchy because attention really is, is the, the first place we start. If you're not paying attention, you're not gonna learn anything. So if I wanna test your memory, I have to know whether or not your intent, attention is intact. If that makes sense, and it will, I think, as we kind of go through, but attention is the most basic cognitive construct. It reflects the conscious processing of information. So if I ask you to look over here and you're not looking over there, you can't very well process a stimulus that you're not attending to. Um, there are a couple different kinds of attention that we measure from a cognitive standpoint. One's called sustained attention. And this is really the kind of um, test where you're, it, it is almost inherently and almost always very boring because the idea is you're supposed to sustain attention even though something is boring. So if I'm asking you to identify an X on a screen and you're just pressing a button and I have you do it for 20 minutes, we expect that at minute 18, you're gonna to start to fade out your attention. Um, if you have sustained attentional impairments, that will happen earlier. And so that kind of measures how long you can hold your attention on something even if it's not particularly exciting. Attentional shifting is just the ability to move attention like a spotlight from one thing to another. Um, and selective attention is a more, um, is a slightly higher order executive attention where you're, you're um, using your own, you're using planned, um, let's see how I can define this. You're using um, something, a target that you know you're looking for and you're kind of selectively attending to that while ruling out the distractors in the background. So these are the, the three sort of most commonly assessed types of attention in neuropsych studies. 
I'm going to give you an example of the next domain we call working memory, and this is slightly higher. This requires the manipulation of information that's being held in short-term memory. So this is the kind of test that we would do here. Um, one very common one is called digits backwards, and I've got an example here. It's a little bit of a, um, a cheat to have everyone at home watching this and, and not able to kind of do it in, in, a, in an audience, in a group. But what I would do as a neuropsychologist is I would read, you wouldn't see these numbers as you're seeing them on the screen. I would read these numbers and then I would ask you to tell them to me backwards. So I would say two, nine, four, six, seven. And you would, without looking at the numbers, you would try to answer that. You'd have to hold that in your memory. And if you try to kind of do that, and you can, you can practice along at home if you don't feel too silly speaking out loud um, to yourselves, but this is the reverse order. I'll do this harder one, and if everybody um, wants to play along, these are, these are fun. Um, the, this number is three, six, one, two, seven, three, five, four. And then that goes away and I ask you, tell me those numbers in the reverse order. So you not only have to take the information in, but then you have to manipulate it in order to give me the correct answer. And so there's the correct answer to that. So that gives you an idea. That is that is typically um, thought to be pretty pretty central to the prefrontal cortex, the kind of front part of the brain that is that is involved in executive control. Learning and memory, and this is, I'm showing you a, um, an example of a verbal learning task that is associated with um, words being read to you. You can also do this in a visual analog, so where you're looking more specifically at pictures or shapes that I'm asking you to remember. But what this does is, is these kinds of tests requires a person to maintain information over time. So like anything we learn, what we're asking you to do is to learn the information and then be able to tell it back to me. There's a few components of it that is, that, that is particularly important and you can distinguish things like Alzheimer's disease from depression in terms of cognitive profiles based almost solely on a test like this. And I'll give an example of what, what I mean by that. But the test that I've got written up here is the California Verbal Learning Test. This is simply a list of words. I would read 16 words out loud to you five times. So we do it one and then I would ask you, tell me as many words as you can. I would read it again, tell me as many words as you can, again, and we do it five times. And what we're looking for is a learning curve. The first time you may only be able to tell me 12 words, the second time, hopefully 13. Maybe by the fifth trial, you could get all 16 words and we'd expect to see improvement over time. That means you're learning. And then I would ask you, okay, I'm gonna read a different list of words, try to distract you a little bit. Then I ask you, remember that first list that we read five times, can you tell me that? And that's probably about five minutes after we were done with that. And that gives us an indication of what we call short-term memory. So this is if you've been able to hold what you learned for at least that long. Then we do a bunch of other things. I go through some of these other tests that I'll talk to you about. And about 20 minutes later, I say, remember that list of words that I read to you? Um, can you tell me what those words are again? That we call long-term memory. And so that again is based just on, in part on where the memory is stored in the brain, but largely based on whether or not you have deficits in learning or if you have deficits in retaining information over time. And it's a very different profile. You can get um, very high scores on learning, but if you've only remembered half of what you knew, then that indicates rapid forgetting, which has a dementia-related Alzheimer's profile. If you have severe depression, you'll tend to learn less, and that's largely because you're not attending to the information as much but most of what you learn, you'll retain over time. So, so this is the way we kind of use these tests to differentiate for differential diagnosis and to try to get at which parts of a cognitive, um, which parts of cognition are problematic for people. Because typically it's not everything. We typically see, um, in almost everybody, we see very clear strengths and weaknesses. And this is part of the purpose of testing. So I think this is the last domain I'm gonna talk about, which is executive functioning. This is the highest order cognition. This is the idea that we are able to abstract information. We're able to problem solve around things and flexibly change approaches to try to work things out. 
Um, and fluency is also a portion of this. And so I can give an example of a fluency test where I would ask you, I'm gonna give you one minute. We're not really gonna do this right now, but I would give you one minute and ask you to tell me as many animals as you can think of, as quickly as you can. And then I'd start a stopwatch and you would start naming animals and we would just try to get as many of these as you can. This indicates again, some form of executive functioning and is largely based in the frontal lobe of the brain. So this will be an example that is, is I think the most fun example and hopefully you guys will play along at home because it is um, an example when you're kind of thinking about these tests and we think about what do these really mean? Are, are these kinds of silly games that we're playing in the lab actually telling you anything about my brain? And this gives you a kind of nice example of how these tests actually measure brain function. And typically when we do this in an audience, it's pretty obvious that people have gotten this. But what I'm gonna ask you to do, as silly as it sounds in your, in your house or wherever you may be, is to out loud read the word that you see on the next few screens. I'm gonna flip through some screens. Read that word as quickly as you can out loud. Okay. So hopefully you read those names of um, colors. Next, I'm gonna ask you on the next several screens to name the color of the X's that you see as quickly as you can. So name the color of the X's that you see. Okay. Now I'm gonna ask you to do the final part of the test, which is to do the same thing I just asked you to do. I want you to name the color of the word that you see. So name the color of the word. Okay, so for those of you who, who played along with this, what you will have realized is that, that this last thing, what we're seeing on the screen right now, this last section of words, were words where the meaning is incongruent with the color of the ink that it's printed in. So while the word says yellow, your response should have been green. And what happens when we do this test, this conflict that's introduced, your brain struggles. And you can pretty much feel your brain struggle when you do this test, which is why I like to use this as an example. There are very well understood neural circuits that are associated with performance of this test, which I'm gonna show you on the next screen. But importantly, what, what we're doing here is we're taking advantage of the fact that once you've learned to read, your brain is programmed very strongly to read the meaning of a word. Whenever you see a word, you read it and you read yellow here. That's your automated response because we're so automated in the way that we read. But because I've asked you not to read, but to instead name the, the color of the word, I've introduced this conflict and that your brain has to overcome the automated response of reading the word in favor of what I've asked you to do, which is to name the color, okay? And so this conflict is, is mapped to a very specific part of the brain. And this is just an, an example of the way in which we know these tests are, are really specifically targeting neural circuits, connect, connections between brain parts. And we, can, and we know when there's impairment on these tests that there's something wrong with specific brain regions in many cases. So this is really just a, a kind of um, uh, me rationalizing the use of sometimes very simple paper pencil tests that kind of get at, at neural circuitry and really get at brain function in, a, in an impressive way, I think. And what you're looking at on the left are just some activation patterns of brain regions that occur when people are doing that exact test in the scanner. And on the right side here, where you see the picture of the brain are the two lit up regions that are most related to, to performance on this Stroop task specifically. This is very well understood across many disorders as well as in healthy people, you see the same exact pattern. And I won't go through the, the specific details here, but generally what you're seeing is that there's this region called the uh, dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. It's part of the prefrontal cortex of the brain. And when you're asked to do the reading and you're asked to just name the color of the X's, you see some activation here when, when we ask you to, to name the color, the color of the X's. There's a little bit of effort associated with that. But when we introduce that conflict, 
what the brain region that comes online, which is called the anterior cingulate cortex, the ACC indicated by the green arrow. My pointer doesn't seem to be working. Indicated by the green arrow, that brain region comes online to process the conflict so that when your brain wants to read, you are saying, no, I need you to name the color. That is the region of the brain that is impaired when patients perform this task. So everybody slows down when you have that conflict introduced. The, the, your reaction time will slow down. You might make an error or two. But in patients with psychiatric illness, it slows them down more. So we see impairment relative to healthy individuals. They struggle more with that conflict. It takes them longer and they'll make more mistakes. And this is just a graph that shows you that the deficits on this specific task, the Stroop, across multiple different psychiatric illnesses. Um, I'll point out the, the horizontal axis is referencing the, the diagnoses that this has been done in. These are large scale meta-analyses which group lots of patients together to look at the, the level of impairment. We have major depression, bipolar disorder, affective psychosis, and schizophrenia represented here. The vertical axis is what's called an effect size, which is kind of irrelevant. What I wanted to point out here is that the deficits that are seen are what we would think of as moderate to relatively severe impairments, regardless of what your diagnosis is. So we see this on the group level in, in patients who have depression, as well as in patients who have schizophrenia. You see a little bit of a more severe picture in schizophrenia, but generally speaking, this is just providing an example that these kind of impairments are seen across diagnoses. And that this, again, speaks back to the initial slides I talked about where we're learning more about the way in which the brain changes across diagnoses, not in any one specific illness. So when we look across a, a broader view of, of cognition, we look at full profiles of patients. I talked a little, or little bit already about these domains and tried to define them. I think I failed to tell you about speed of processing, which is the first one on the, on the horizontal axis. But these are the domains that we assessed in a, a um, study about 10 years ago now um, in patients with schizophrenia and compared them with patients with bipolar disorder. We looked at speed of processing, which is just how quickly you can code something. Um, we looked at attention. We looked at working memory, verbal learning, visual learning, reasoning and problem solving, which is the executive function component. And we also looked at social cognition in these patients. So this was a battery that took about 90 minutes, about an hour and a half for people to complete. And it gives us a, an idea of strengths and weaknesses on different measures, um, rather than just getting a single measure of, of cognition. So what you're seeing in this graph is the, the blue line are healthy individuals. So these are patients, these are individuals who are not diagnosed with a psychiatric illness. And in the red line, these are patients who are diagnosed with bipolar disorder, bipolar one disorder. Um, they are currently, when tested, not ill. So they are, their affective symptoms are well under control at this point of testing. Likewise, the green line are patients with schizophrenia, and they're in what we call the residual phase of the disease when patients are experiencing minimal symptoms in schizophrenia. So we're thinking that specifically these profiles that you see are the profiles that persist over time in these kinds of patients. And the two things that I'm gonna highlight here are, are first that the lines that you see in the patients are similar to one another. The shape of the curve looks pretty similar. So that suggests that there's overlap, qualitative overlap, with regard to cognitive problems in patients with bipolar disorder and patients with schizophrenia. They experience the same types of deficits and do better on the same types of tests. But what we see in this study and what many, many studies have shown is that when you look at the group level, patients with schizophrenia do consistently worse than patients with bipolar disorder. And this is just, again, pointing out that the severity of the impairment that's typically seen in groups of patients with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia is about one standard deviation below average in bipolar disorder and about two standard deviations below average in schizophrenia. So it's more severe impairment, but qualitatively, it looks relatively similar. We also know that there are, um, there's differences in the prevalence of cognitive impairment. So I think this is incredibly important, whether you're a clinician who's talking to a patient or whether you're a patient yourself, 
that not all patients with schizophrenia have cognitive impairment and not all patients with bipolar disorder have cognitive impairment. Some do. And so this graph just shows us what the prevalence of that is. That means what the frequency of cognitive impairment that's seen in groups of patients with these diagnoses. Patients with schizophrenia, about 85% of those patients with, that are diagnosed with schizophrenia will show significant cognitive impairment. In this particular study, this is defined as one standard deviation below average or more. And so the majority of patients will meet this cutoff. What we're seeing in the middle bar are bipolar patients who have a psychosis history. So they experience psychosis during their course of their illness. And on the right are bipolar patients who never experience psychosis as part of their illness, but also carry a bipolar diagnosis. And what you can see here is that depending on psychosis history, anywhere between 40% and 60% of patients with this diagnosis will show this level of cognitive impairment, but about as many will not show cognitive impairment relative to healthy individuals. So somewhere between 40 and 60% of patients with bipolar disorder will show normal cognitive functioning. Smaller percentage of schizophrenia patients will show normal cognitive functioning, but some of them will. And so this is not in any way, um, when I present all of, all of what I'm talking about, we in a research field look at patients as a group, as if patients are all the same, we know that they're not. Um, but this is sort of the way that we think about it and present it. It's very different at the individual level. And so I wanna make sure that that's clear in, in all of what I'm saying really. Um, and I think this, the, these data point to that specifically. Okay, so um, I'm just, I think I saw a chat box pop up and wanna make sure it wasn't, I'm okay for time, okay? Yeah, um, just chime in Sagar if I need to, Oh, okay, we're at 7.40, I'll, I'll move along. Um, so why is cognition important? There's a couple reasons, and then I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, some of the causes, and then very little about what we can do to stop it, because that we're a little bit further behind in the field than I'd like to admit. Um, the role of cognition itself is, is critical. It's absolutely core to the disease. So I'm showing you here an emotion regulation circuitry, so this is most relevant to major depression and to bipolar disorder, but there's similar deficits that we see in schizophrenia that contribute to the disease itself. What we see is that this is a cartoon depiction of the brain, and I'm showing you a very simplistic version of the circuitry that's associated with affective regulation. So the way that we regulate emotions in our lives. This region here in the middle is called the limbic system. And this is um, the part of the brain that's responsible for interpreting stimuli from the environment. That's to say, if a snake slithers through your yard and you immediately have a fearful response, that's a very automated response to what we as humans deem to be a fearful stimulus. If you're in a zoo and you see the same snake, the likelihood that you are afraid that your amygdala will fire is similar because it is an automated survival response of the brain. In contrast, this part of the brain, this prefrontal cortex, which I've mentioned a few times, is responsible for cognitive control, and it's responsible for what we call executive functioning. It's very much responsible for regulating your response to that snake and to the stimuli and to your amygdala firing. So this part of your brain is absolutely critical to controlling your behavior when this occurs and to your interpretation of this stimulus. So in the, the example I gave in the zoo, this part of your brain would then send signals to your amyg amygdala to shut down because it's no need to be afraid, the snake's behind glass. So that's a, a very simple example of that. This circuitry is impaired in patients with major mood disorders, and it drives the disorder in many ways. So these impairments that we see in cognition are actually core features of the disease. They place patients at risk for developing depression and for the recurrence of episodes of depression. The way this works is because in individuals who have major mood disorders, they're more likely, their amygdala is more likely to fire when a stimulus is neutral. So not fearful, not a snake, something that is the rest of us might deem to be just neutral, nothing, nothing, no problem there. Once, uh, but with 
people with major mood disorders, the amygdala will fire as if there is something negative in the environment. Then there is a shutdown of, there's a regulatory failure up here in the prefrontal cortex, which allows that negative stimulus to make its way into consciousness and places a person at risk for depression because of this. So this is one of the reasons why cognition is important. It is, it is core to the, the circuitry of the brain, things we know about what's going wrong in the brain that is associated with depression and its recurrence. In addition, and perhaps most importantly for patients, cognition contributes directly to functional disability. So on the left, you're seeing the World Health Organization's rankings of the top 10 causes of disability in the world. And you'll see unipolar major depression is number one, bipolar disorder is on the top 10, and schizophrenia is on the top 10. They rank among violence and war for disability. And so th these, these particularly when added together account for a massive amount of disability in the world. When we look at what causes the disability in patients, one might argue that things like mania can cause disability. Things like depression certainly cause disability. But when we look in larger studies of patients with schizophrenia, with bipolar disorder, with major depression, we're most interested in the, the period at which we've done a pretty good job of treating those primary symptoms. Once we've got the depression under control or the mania under control or the psychosis under control, patients should be able to go back to work. And for some reason, many patients cannot. And so many studies now, which you kind of see a, a, a relatively busy depiction of this on the right side of the screen, many patients continue to suffer from disability and are unable to work or unable to work at the level they did prior to the onset of illness. And when we've gone through many different kinds of studies looking at this, the single strongest predictor of functional disability in patients who have been pretty well treated is cognition. So those who have persistent cognitive impairment after the mania subsides are the ones who can't get back to work and are having problems in social functioning and other everyday life components. So this is really the reason why cognition matters most in patients' lives and should matter in clinicians' lives because at this point, our goal is always to treat the primary components, treat the mania, but once that's treated, we often as clinicians tend to ignore these components that could still contribute to how people are functioning in the world and reduce quality of life substantially. So in an effort to promote full recovery, the goal here is to treat cognition directly. I'll give a couple kind of quick overviews of what the causes are thought to be of cognitive problems. First, I'm gonna talk very briefly about what we know about how cognitive impairments develop over time in patients diagnosed with these disorders. First, I'm gonna show you the, um, the black line that's seen on this um, hypothetical depiction of cognitive development. You see along the bottom from childhood through late adulthood, the, the solid black line indicates normal neurodevelopment, normal cognitive development, where individuals get better at cognitive tests and do better on cognition, better cognitive skills, until late adolescence, early adulthood, and that stabilizes over time. In individuals with this dotted line here, individuals who later develop schizophrenia are represented on this dotted line. And what we see in the cognitive development of these individuals are cognitive impairments relative to healthy people as early as we measure them. So at age two, three, five, and they constantly over the course of development lag behind their peers from a cognitive standpoint. Just before they have the first episode or psychotic episode of schizophrenia, you see a dip in cognitive functioning, then the psychosis emerges, and then you see a relative stabilization of cognition, but well below that of non-psychiatric controls. So this is thought to be related, and I'm not gonna get into a lot of detail here, to what we call a neurodevelopmental hypothesis of schizophrenia. It suggests that the problems that are occurring in the brain occur at birth. They occur likely in utero. This is contributing also from genetic causes. And so these cognitive problems are very long standing and are thought to be neurodevelopmental in the nature of them. In contrast, what we think we understand about bipolar disorder is that, is represented here on the gray line that you see, is that there's normal cognitive development 
up until the point of the first episode of mania or depression. At the point of the first episode, which typically occurs around the same time in schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, typically onset in the early 20s, you see a drop in cognitive function associated with the first episode and a kind of wavy line depicting a decline over time in cognition. That decline is not linear. It's not just a over time you get worse. Those arrows indicate episodes. And so it's thought that each time an episode occurs, that the brains of patients with recurrent mood disorders take a hit. And there's something that's happening in the brain that causes cognitive decline that's associated with these repeated episodes. And that that accumulates over time. And then here are the other possible causes of cognitive impairment. Now, particularly we're thinking about the kinds of causes of impairment that happen after the onset of illness for the most part regardless of which illness you have. I show more examples here of bipolar disorder because there's some subsets of, or subsamples of patients with bipolar disorder. But the goal of this slide in large part is to say that there's a lot of possible causes of cognitive impairment. We don't really know the answer to this question. We're, we're doing a lot to try to study it and to think about this and, and to, to break it down, but the, the short answer is almost certainly there are a lot of causes of cognitive impairment. And in any one individual, they're probably not the same as they might be in a different individual. They're also almost certainly multifactorial. Probably it's more than just having bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. It may be that patients with these disorders have very high rates of substance use and substance abuse, including alcohol, cannabis, and other substances of abuse very high rates relative to healthy individuals. It may be that all of these groups of patients are also at a much elevated risk for reporting very severe childhood abuse. So early life risk factors contribute to cognitive problems that are associated in later life in these patients. There are anxiety symptoms and full-blown anxiety disorders in many of our patients with schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. And the medical comorbidities are high. So patients with both disorders are more likely to have cardiovascular problems, metabolic problems, be overweight. Some of this is a consequence of treatment associated with the illness, but all of these things, including poor sleep and so on, are likely to contribute to poor cognitive outcome. So it's a messy question, and it's one that I think is one to sort of pose at the individual patient level. Can we treat these deficits? So the important question here is, we know I've told you already that cognitive deficits are among the strongest predictors of functional disability. We need to treat them. They don't seem to respond to standard treatment. Mood stabilization and antipsychotics don't seem to, to treat the cognitive problems associated with the illness. It's absolutely necessary we start to consider directly targeting them with both drug and non-drug approaches. And there are many experimental trials underway in schizophrenia. There's far fewer in bipolar disorder, but we're making progress there. I'm gonna skip over this slide for the sake of time so we can get to the questions. This is just a study we published a while back that was looking at um, uh, one particular drug that we thought might be helpful in treating cognition in patients with bipolar disorder. So just to conclude, cognitive dysfunction is a core feature of bipolar disorder and schizophrenia. It's also likely to be a component of the illness and other psychiatric illnesses. It's important to recognize that not all patients are impaired, some are, and impairment may be driven by multiple different causative factors, including the symptoms, the course of the illness, early life risk factors, medications, and other comorbidities. And targeted treatment strategies are the next step in promoting full recovery for patients. Thank you. I'm going to stop and take some questions. I've gone a little longer than I expected, as usual. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Burdick. Uh, after seeing your presentation, uh, my main reaction is yellow, no, green, I mean <laughs> blue. Um, this, that Stroop test is always a, a kind of a challenge. Yeah. We do have some questions, and I guess uh, one of the first ones is a very practical question. Um, what should I uh, ask my doctor or clinician to uh, uh, prescribe in terms of a test uh, because going for neuropsychological testing costs a lot of money and in many hours. Is there something that the average clinician can do? Yeah, that's a great question, Sagar. And, and um, it, 
Absolutely. Um, we've made a little bit of progress in this in the field. It's something that all clinicians should have available, but it has been, it's, it's very often a question that I get um, when I give talks about this. The ISBD task force, so this is, as you know, the International Society for Bipolar Disorder has a cognition task force where one of the first goals for the task force was to get something freely available online that clinicians could use to assess cognition. And this, you're right, is very important because most clinicians don't have the time to do it. They don't have the expertise to do it and they feel like they need a certain kind of expertise. The interpretation of the data is not always straightforward. On the website for the ISBD, and I'm sorry, I, I don't have a link for it, but, but it is um, the ISBD Cognition Task Force on their website. There is a um, suggestion of two, two batteries. There's one called the SKIP which is actual tests that a clinician can access, give to a patient, it's very brief, 15 minutes, can give to a patient and it will, it has normative data, which means it will compare the patient with their age-related peers. It'll give you an idea of if they're impaired or not. It won't just give you a raw score that doesn't mean anything to you. So that's one of them. And the other one that is on the website that's available is called the COBRA. And that one is more of a subjective questionnaire. So that's just asking the patient how they feel about their cognitive performance. Sometimes that reflects real cognitive impairment. Sometimes it just reflects complaints about cognitive problems that may or may not be seen on cognitive tests. So um, I'll just clarify uh, just and repeat. Uh, one, you know, a lot of your work is in bipolar disorder. Uh, one of the major organizations uh, that uh, is involved with bipolar disorder is called the International Society for Bipolar Disorders. And if you just type in I, S, B, D, and the word cognition uh, into Google, it'll take you to directly to the portion of the website that has a couple of those rating scales that you mentioned, the SKIP or the COBRA. And so that'll be a handy way for clinicians to figure out if there is a cognitive problem present. Um, I, should, I should quickly, as, as you said, Sagar, I should quickly note the SKIP is certainly um, a, a battery that could be used in other disorders. These are not um, uh, bipolar specific. All right, thank you. Yeah. And um, uh, since we're talking about that website, I know that you've also co-authored a very patient-friendly booklet and it's called Cognition in Bipolar Disorder and it's also on the, that website. Do you want to tell us a little bit about what's in that booklet? Yeah, so some of what we just talked about is in that. It kind of talks a little bit about what cognition is, how we measure it. It talks about why it's particularly relevant for patients in terms of because of the fact that it really influences everyday functions. Um, and it also gives some um, some recommendations about some of the kind of things you can do to try to keep your brain healthy um, despite having a diagnosis of bipolar disorder or, or another psychiatric illness. Um, I think I'll, I'll jump to that next question, which is what are those things that can keep our brain healthy? We talked a little bit about this this morning. Um, there are no easy solutions there, but there, what, what we recommend is the same thing we recommend to most healthy people to keep their brain um, healthy over age as we kind of age exercise, good diet, um, making sure that your brain continues to be active, reading, puzzles, those types of things seem kind of trivial and almost silly, but they, they really do um, help to fend off some of the decline, I think, that's been, that's been seen, not just associated with psychiatric illness, but with aging itself. Thanks. Um, the, the, the next question is about treatments. And, you know, you briefly just mentioned uh, that uh, a lot of research needs to be done, but either for schizophrenia or for bipolar disorder, are there a couple of treatments that you could cite as, you know, having some some uh, evidence or efficacy? Um, I, I think, unfortunately, I would say no. Now, I, the reason I say that, the reason I'm hesitant to name anything as being helpful is because I think there are things that are likely to be helpful for individuals. There is nothing that's been shown to be helpful enough to get an FDA indication um, in either cognition in schizophrenia or in bipolar disorder. There is, I'll give the one example that has an FDA label, which is not the same as an indication, which is vortioxetine. 
Um, it is an antidepressant medication, so the use of that in bipolar disorder would have to be concurrent with a mood stabilizer to ensure safety. Um, but vortioxetine does have some data that's now published and, and has gone through FDA regulations to suggest that in the context of treating depression, it may also benefit cognition. Okay. It's a little different than saying it enhances cognition, but that's the one that's crossed the FDA's barrier. Um, the, others, the others we talk about are probably more individualized. The screenshot that I showed was, was Pramipexol, which is a dopamine agonist. We found some early promising data. Follow-up studies weren't whoppingly positive, so that may or may not be helpful. I think it will be in some patients. You know, I think it's like all of the other medications we use. Unfortunately, it's a little bit of trial and error. There are some worth trying. Um, and I think it's a bit of a bit of trial and error to figure out whether it's helpful to you as an individual and for you and your clinician to work on that question. Well, we know that there are some FDA approved treatments for uh, certain kinds of cognitive problems like ADHD. So yeah. there are stimulant medications, you know, common names for this include methylphenidate or Ritalin, and there are others. Uh, do you see that those as having some sort of partial role or temporary role uh, in, in cognition, either in depression or in bipolar disorder for that matter? Yeah, so that's a, a great question. Um, th that would be kind of the one of the most obvious places to start. And certainly if there are, um, if the pattern of impairment indicates attentional deficits, such as those seen in attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, then it certainly um, is worth a try. And, and because it does target those specific domains and, it, and those drugs work on those kinds of cognitive problems, um, th they may well be helpful. The one thing, of course, again, the caveat being is that typically needs to be adjunctive or added on to other medications, particularly in patients with bipolar disorder. Those types of stimulant medications are quite safe in most people. Um, they have a higher risk in patients with bipolar disorder of switching patients into mania. And typically that can be avoided by having a good mood stabilizer on board that will stop that from happening. Um, I think many clinicians will use it in the context of having a, a solid mood stabilizer on board and, and it can be beneficial. All right, uh, we have time for two more questions. Uh, one question was about uh, one of the figures that you showed that suggested that uh, after 20 years of bipolar illness, maybe the average bipolar patient, uh, their cognition will be impaired as much as an individual who ha has schizophrenia. Was that a correct interpretation of what you were showing? So possibly, um, and I think, I think that right. So the, the, the figure that I showed, important to kind of note that those were hypothetical curves, first of all, the sort of depiction of what we think happens over time. Um, they weren't on a perfect scale and they, they weren't at in any way reflective of what an individual's course would look like. In a very progressive and aggressive form of bipolar illness, that's possible. It certainly is possible that after being hospitalized 10, 20 times for mania, that there may be cognitive decline that approaches the, the significance and severity that's seen in patients with schizophrenia. Um, in other work that I've done that I talked a little bit more about this morning, there is a subgroup of patients with bipolar disorder who do have cognitive impairment that is comparable to that seen in schizophrenia. But there's also a group of bipolar patients who have cognition that is at least as good as healthy individuals, if not better, and some of them have been ill for 20 years too. So it's very individualized. It's really hard to kind of put a label on them as a group, but this is kind of, um, it, it is possible. So we've spoken a fair bit about medications. Uh, what, the next question is, what about therapies for medication resistant bipolar disorder? And I think I take from that, that the person's probably tried a lot of medicines and maybe the bipolar illness is not that well controlled right. and maybe they don't want to take you know, yet another pill to try and help with cognition. Um, what, what options uh, might there be even in, in a research world? 
Yeah. So, um, you know, some of the psychosocial interventions that are most evidence-based that seem to have the most evidence behind them that are likely to influence cognition are things like what we call IPSRT, which is interpersonal social rhythms therapy. Um, this, this is very much focused around regulating uh, rhythms. So it's to say that you need to go to sleep at the same time of night, you need to wake up the same time of day, you should eat your breakfast at the same time. And the social component of that is, is that you should eat your meals with your friend or your family member, that this should be a very routine kind of thing. There's plenty of evidence that sleep is, is very problematic for many patients and certainly for many treatment resistant patients. Sleep medications can help, but they typically don't do enough. And these kinds of um, non-medication approaches will likely also influence cognition. For any of us who have had a bad night's sleep, who have skipped a night of sleep, we know that we're not thinking clearly the next day. We know that we have trouble concentrating. Sleep deficits contribute hugely to these problems in patients. And so I would say that's probably one place I would start in thinking about psychosocial interventions that would both stabilize mood as well as help with cognitive problems. And the final question, just to answer very briefly, uh, is do any of the brain games work? You know, we see things advertised on the internet and all that. Uh, are any of those any use? Yeah, so I think so. But I think, you know, are they, would I say that one is any better than another? Not at all. I think as long as they are exercising one's brain, they certainly can't hurt. Um, will they correct cognitive impairment? There's no evidence of that just now. Um, but just like the evidence that if you do crossword puzzles every day, and if you read books, and if you continue in your education as you get older, or even if you're just learning how to knit and various different things, keeping your brain active in that way and exercising your brain is good for your brain. And it, it helps to protect your brain against decline. Will it improve your cognition? Probably not. Um, these brain games are like those. The, they're probably not different from crossword puzzles if you want to save your money. Um, but you want to find something you like doing that exercises your brain and, and keep doing it. Well, uh, and on that note, uh, you know, I want to thank you for exercising all of our brains and uh, teaching us uh, about some of the twists and turns and challenges of understanding cognitive impairment related to psychiatric uh, disorders. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Burdick. And to our audience, I, I would uh, encourage you to consider if you have further questions, there is a lot of material on the International Society for Bipolar Disorders website, ISBD, including the booklet uh, that we talked about that helps explain some of these principles, as well as rating scales and other tools that can be useful for clinicians and patients alike. Uh, I want to thank the National Network of Depression Centers for uh, the funding that made it possible for this talk, as well as the other talks that Dr. Burdick has given today and tomorrow at the University of Michigan. And uh, with that, I, uh, I, I will take a, um, another lesson from the talk. And remember, good sleep is a key <laughs> aspect of wellness for all of us as well as uh, particularly for those with mood disorders. So to all, uh, sleep well tonight. Good night. Thank you.